Um, so what I really want out of this presentation is for you to walk away understanding you know, what is the thyroid, how is it in balance, what are all the factors contributing to its health, nutrition, and really what can you do about it? Uh, if you, when I went through medical school, we were told to basically check something called TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone, and if it was outside of a certain range, you give people uh, levothyroxine, brand names being Levoxyl and Synthroid, and that's it. That's really all we were told. We were told about how the thyroid works, but kind of that's all you need to know. Well, you get out in clinical practice and you find that that works a good chunk of the time, but sometimes it doesn't. And so I felt inspired to look a little deeper, largely because I had patients that just weren't getting better in certain situations. And they encouraged me to keep going with it. And you find that there's a lot of people out there with thyroid conditions who are not happy with the way they're being treated. And there's some very simple things that can be done once you understand how it all fits together. So, you may have seen these words before, holistic, alternative, complementary, and alternative. A lot of this um, start happened a couple of decades ago when there was a resurgence in what's now called integrative medicine. It started out with alternative medicine as something outside of Western medicine. From there, like complementary and alternative, it's like, wait, this might be useful used with Western medicine. And then Andrew Weil coined the term integrative medicine, the idea being that these things are on equal level. They can work well together. There's not a, a hierarchy. Well, at the time, there were kind of some strong personalities in that field, and different groups formed around these personalities, and they all had their same like lingo for talking about the same things. But it was a little confusing because they all used different words for basically describing we're an interdependent system. Everything inside of ourselves affects everything, and it doesn't end with our skin. So our environment, our relationships, our exposures during our youth to various experiences or toxins all play a role. And in the past decade, we found a lot more through the study of epigenetics, what influences our genetic expression and various other things that have proven that there's really not a limit at our skin. And when I went through medical school, we studied the cardiovascular system. Well, turns out your cardiovascular system is largely impacted by your endocrine system, by your microbiome, the, the critters that live in you and on you. And this developed a different view that's now being called systems biology. And the NIH, National Institute of Health, has developed a whole division looking at systems biology. And it's a whole new way of looking at how everything fits together. It's in some ways, a very old way of looking at how everything fits together. If you look at Ayurveda, Tibetan medicine, some forms of African medicine, Chinese medicine, they all had this view that everything affects everything. And we're only now able, from a Western medicine perspective, to measure that and document that and trace these relationships. So it's kind of an exciting time. Um, so this is the NIH statement about systems biology. And paraphrase, it's just everything affects everything. They had to use a lot of fancy language to say that, to justify this perspective, but that's what they're getting at. Um, so when we're looking at the thyroid and the endocrine system in general, um, this system's perspective allows us to understand people who didn't respond to that standard measure TSH only, give them T4. It allows us to kind of look under the hood a bit and see how nutrient deficiencies, environmental exposures, autoimmune conditions, hidden inflammation, all can drive the thyroid and other aspects of health. How the state of your microbiome will influence your thyroid and, and, and so on. So uh, that's what we'll be doing tonight is looking at thyroid health from a systems biology perspective. Um, so, the standard way of looking at it is your hypothalamus, which is in your brain, sends a message to your pituitary, and your pituitary sends a message to your thyroid. So they call it the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Well, now with this expanded perspective, 
It's your genetic, epigenetic, psychologic, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, gonadal, meaning your sex organs, thyroid, your immune system, your microbiome, the critters that are in you and on you, your community, in other words, your relationships, interpersonal relationships, and your environmental system. All of these things weave together to affect your health. And the thyroid is a perfect inroad to talk about this because in many ways, hypothyroidism is like the canary in the coal mine. Have you guys ever heard that phrase? So with coal miners, they would take a canary down because they're very sensitive to carbon monoxide. And the canary would start to show distress well before the miners would. And they could use that as a signal to, well, we need to get out of here. Well, uh, hypothyroidism, particularly some of the autoimmune hypothyroid conditions, are kind of like the canary in the coal mine. They are probably, well, they're on the rise now, and that's probably because of psycho-emotional stress, environmental toxicities, uh, nutritional deficiencies in our food chain, and things like that. And so we're seeing a rise in hypothyroidism, and it's probably a symptom of imbalances in larger systems, okay? So let's just talk about nuts and bolts thyroids. This is kind of a complex picture here. There's a guy, if you go on YouTube, it's called Strong Medicine, and it's Dr. Strong. He's actually got some really good videos. Um, they're made for medical students to be able to review medical stuff. He teaches at one of the medical schools. I don't remember which one it is. But we're going to go through this pathway because we're going to reference it later. This is your brain. Your hypothalamus produces something called TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone, and that signals something called your pituitary to make TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And this is what most doctors will check, okay? And that's all they'll check. And so TSH sends a message to your thyroid, which is at your throat, the butterfly shaped gland here, and TSH drives your thyroid to make more. T4. So you think of TSH kind of like the gas pedal. So TSH drives the thyroid to make more of this stuff called T4. T4, the medication is levothyroxine, synthroid, levoxyl. And the 4 is the number of iodines on a tyrosine, a tyrosine um, molecule there. And then something called a deiodinase takes off an iodine. So it deiodinates, okay? It's appropriately named. It takes an iodine off, and T4 becomes T3, or something called reverse T3. T3 is the active hormone, okay? That is what gets the job done. Reverse T3, the only difference between the two is a different deiodinase takes off a different iodine. That's the only difference between them from a biochemistry perspective is so you got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and just takes a different one off. But the difference in that iodine is huge as far as the impact. T3 will stimulate the thyroid receptor in a positive way. Reverse T3 does not. Reverse T3 actually can occupy the receptor and block T3 from binding. Basically, sending a message of slow down, cool down, um, turning down your metabolism. Okay, we'll get into that in a moment. And so um, all you really need to remember from this is TSH, T4, T3, reverse T3, and this thing called a deiodinase that kicks off an iodine. Okay? Over here is interesting, and he talks about it in the video if you go watch it on YouTube. Um, there are these two hard to pronounce effects, the wolf Chekhov effect and the jode Bastow effect. And this gets into something that if you've dove into the blogs and various forums on Hashimoto's on the web, there's this controversy around, is iodine good or is iodine bad? And some people are like, oh, never give iodine, never give iodine, don't do it, it's going to make it worse. Or some people are like, oh, you must, it's essential. Well, iodine is essential to make thyroid hormone, because what is thyroid hormone but a tyrosine and a bunch of iodine tacked onto it. So if you don't have iodine, you can't make thyroid hormone. But if you get too much iodine, it can actually suppress your thyroid. And there's a paradoxical thing where iodine can both suppress and stimulate your thyroid, okay? And that's a known scientific thing. 
So when we look online, you're going to see different dosages for iodine. And you'll see microgram doses, MCG. And the US RDA for iodine is 150 micrograms per day. That's how much you need to get in your diet for your thyroid to function. If you go online, you'll see the range for recommended dosage being from about 150 to 450 micrograms. But you're also going to see a dosage in milligrams. So that's a whole factor greater, micrograms versus milligrams. The milligram dosage is often used for treating uh, fibromas and cysts, because there's a correlation between iodine deficiency and fibrocystic breast disease and endometrial fibroids. So sometimes the milligram dosage is used kind of like an intervention to help reduce those. There's some evidence around that. But for thyroid, we're looking at microgram dosage. The milligram dosage may actually stimulate um, these effects here, causing either a suppression or an elevation of your thyroid. So remember, if you're trying to treat the thyroid, just to keep it safe, stay with the milligram dosing. And that dosing will be listed later again. So you make T4 here and T3, and it cruises around the body bound to a protein. Almost all of your hormones cruise around in little taxi cabs called binding globulins. And this one is called a thyroid binding <laughs> globulin because it binds thyroid. So that's what these little blue rectangles are. Now, this is interesting because various things can increase the number of taxi cabs, the thyroid binding globulin. And if you think about it, if you have a lot more binding globulin, it means you're not going to have as much free hormone because your hormone's going to be bound up. So for instance, extra estrogen will increase your thyroid binding globulin and thus reduce your free fraction of thyroid hormone. And so that's why when we're testing thyroid these days, we often will test what's called a free T3 and a free T4, which looks at the fraction that's available. Um, some people will look at a total T3 and total T4 and also look at your thyroid binding globulin level. Um, if we're worried that fluctuations in the thyroid binding globulin are actually causing fluctuations in your symptoms. So thyroid binding globulin are the taxi cabs that the thyroid hormone runs, runs through your body on. So they become free thyroid hormone, they go into the cell, and they stimulate the thyroid receptors and affect your DNA. And you get gene transcription and so on. So if we think about thyroid disease, a lot of people have it. And a whole lot of people, at least 13 million people, are undiagnosed. So that's a chunk of folks out there. If we look at Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune thyroiditis, that's a, a large fraction of the 27 million people estimated to have it. Okay? When we're looking at women in particular, the predominant type of hypothyroid in women is actually Hashimoto's. Um, and so if we look at thyroid disease overall, it's predominantly something that we see in women. Part of that is women are more likely to get autoimmune conditions across the board. Um, it's just one of the statistics that's out there. So let's go over the different thyroid conditions just to get clear about them. So hyperthyroid means your thyroid is putting out too much thyroid hormone. So what are the symptoms of hyperthyroid? Too much T4, too, too much T3. You get, it's like your thermostat's turned on too much and you're overheated. You're having heart palpitations, heat intolerance, anxiety, sweating, um, something called exophthalmos, where your, your eyes start to bulge out. If you look up pictures of Graves' disease, it's, a, it's an extreme example of that. And it's like your eyes will bulge out a little bit. Um, photophobia, diplopia means your eyes kind of cross and you see two things. Um, insomnia, diarrhea, weight loss, tremors, brittle hair. We think about hypothyroid, which is what we're going to really focus on tonight, the difference, it's the reverse. Your thermostat's turned down too much. And so slowed heart rate, fatigue, depression, constipation, um, thinning hair, and, and that sort of stuff. Some of the telltale signs of hypothyroid is actually thinning hair in the lateral aspect of your eyebrows. For some reason, it tends to shrink this way. 
um, weakness, uh, irregular periods, impaired memory, goiter, which is when your thyroid starts to swell. If you look back at pictures before they started to iodize salt, um, you will see people with goiters and large thyroid glands. Okay? And so one of the challenges of thyroid is there are thyroid receptors in every cell in the body. And so you get this huge array of symptoms. So when someone's being treated for thyroid, we don't want to have our blinders on and let's say they're coming in with fatigue. We don't want to assume this is definitely your thyroid. It could be stress, could be insomnia, could be your relationships, could be your adrenals, could be poor digestion, could be loads of other stuff. So whenever we're working with thyroid, we want to keep our eyes open and not always assume that it's thyroid. I've, I've had patients that when they get tired, they just take more thyroid hormone and they've actually gotten themselves into jeopardy where I was like, you got to stop doing that. It's dangerous because they start getting heart palpitations, driving, taking more and more of the medication without telling me. And, and that can be a problem. And a couple of them, they just had shift work disorder. They were nurses that were working second or third shift and been doing it for 15 years. And it was their shift work problem. It wasn't partly their thyroid affected by their shift work, but more thyroid medication wasn't the solution. Okay? So let's talk about differentiating the different kinds. So one of the things that they said in medical school, which I very much believe in, is when you're looking at labs, first look at the patient. Because you can look at the numbers, but ultimately you're treating the person. And there's a range of normal values. And you want to find the, the place where the person's symptoms are alleviated and they feel the best. And so there's some practitioners out there that are trying to get your number like a T3 of 3.5. And they read somewhere that that's where you want it. That's the ideal thing. Well, some people with a TS, uh, T3 of 3.5, they're going to be jacked out of their minds. Their in engine's going to be revving and they're going to have heart palpitations. They'll be overtreated. And so treat the person, not the number. The numbers give you a guide for safety. Um, so primary and hyper and hypothyroidism is really what we're most familiar with. That's hyperthyroidism may happen because you have an overactive nodule. You can get these things called thyroid nodules or hot nodules where part of your thyroid, for whatever reason, decided to get overactive and it just starts cranking out a bunch of T4. And the treatment for that um, is you can look maybe under the hood and see if there's anything driving that. Um, and if not, if it's just some renegade tissue that developed for various reasons, often they will take that thyroid nodule out, it's like thyroid surgery, and sometimes people resolve to completely normal function. Um, sometimes they will use a treatment called radioactive iodine, because iodine is preferentially taken up in the thyroid, so it's kind of like a targeted chemotherapy for the thyroid, and it, they'll try to dose it to knock out a portion of the thyroid. Sometimes they get the dosage right, sometimes they overdo it, and then those people may be on thyroid medication and result. Um, primary hypothyroidism is what we're going to talk most about. Now, central hypo and hypothyroidism, that's happening at the level of the brain. It's much more rare and um, that's usually due to damage at the level of the pituitary or the hypothalamus. There are inherited forms of this that can happen. Usually they'll present earlier on or if there's a brain tumor later on or something like that. So I don't see too much of this and when I do, I'm referring out based off of like MRIs and things like that because these people may need surgery for a brain tumor. So this is not what we're going to focus on tonight. Um, okay. So we're going to go through a couple controversial diagnoses in hypothyroidism. So this next one, subclinical hypothyroidism. It's a standard Western diagnosis. There's an ICD-10 code for it. So it's, that means it's kind of accepted in Western medicine. And subclinical hypothyroidism basically is when you're symptomatic, but your TSH and free T4 are within range. Now, we're going to go over what normal range is based off of lab results from uh, the big labs. 
And we're going to go over what the normal range is based off of the U.S. Endocrinology Society and also what they follow in other countries, in Europe, Japan, and elsewhere. Because what's reported on a lab report is actually a range wider than even what the U.S. endocrinologists follow. Okay? And so, uh, for example, like TSH, the normal range reported on, by most labs is from 0.45 to 4.5. This is the range. And most endocrinologists in the U.S. actually say that 0.5 to 3 is really the actual range. And if we look at over in Europe, the top end is 2.0 to 2.5, depending on where you are. And so that narrows the range a lot. And so a lot more people wind up getting called hypothyroid based off of that narrowed range. So what are the symptoms they might have? If we think back to that long list of what hypothyroidism can call, you know, weight gain, fatigue, um, kind of suppressed heart rate, poor exercise tolerance, constipation, hair loss, um, glucose intolerance, uh, high cholesterol, all this stuff. So do you treat it? Well, there's a big study looking at whether or not you treat subclinical hypothyroidism, but the study said, do you give them T4? Do you give them Levoxyl, um, Synthroid, uh, Levothyroxine? And in the study, they said, well, it had no apparent benefit, actually. But the bigger question is, do you treat them with T4, or do you look at maybe what's driving their subclinical hypothyroidism? Because it turns out that a lot of subclinical hypothyroidism is actually related to malnutrition, or to inflammation, or to stress, or some of the other things that we'll get into. So when I find someone who's got this subclinical hypothyroidism, the first thing I do is I look at their life. I look, are they sleeping? Are they stressed? What are they eating? Do they get enough iodine? Do they have enough iron and vitamin D and other things that are essential for proper thyroid function? And very often when we get that up and balanced, this can get a lot better. Yeah. Um, so autoimmune thyroid. So there are two kinds, basically. You have autoimmune hyperthyroid and autoimmune hypothyroid. Autoimmune hyperthyroid is also called Graves' disease, okay? Autoimmune hypothyroid is called Hashimoto's. So in Graves' disease, the test is looking for what are called thyroid-stimulating antibodies. So for some reason, these people have developed antibodies, part of their immune system developed antibodies that stimulate the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. So it's kind of functioning like TSH. It's saying, hey, make more, make more. And they wound up cranking out extra thyroid hormone and get hyperthyroid symptoms. When we look at Hashimoto's, you're making antibodies called um, antithyroperoxidase and antithyroglobulin. These are both um, proteins that are in the thyroid gland itself. And the effect of these antibodies is basically to attack the thyroid and suppress the thyroid. So your thyroid has trouble making the, the hormone that it's supposed to. And your thyroid makes a little T3, T3 but it makes predominantly T4. Okay? And so it's interesting when we look at um, the prevalence of these antibodies in the population, they're actually fairly common. Some studies say 10% of the population to 20% of the population are actually making these antibodies. And there's a lot of folks who are asymptomatic even though that they, they have low levels of these antibodies. And the question is, is it ever going to tip into full Hashimoto's or not? Um, it's a lot more common in women, although I do have some men, men patients with this, male patients with that. Um, is there an age range for that? For Hashimoto's? Um, not that I know of. What I can say is for autoimmune conditions in general, um, they'll often start kicking in the late 20s, 30s for some reason. That's, that's a, often it'll kick in. Sometimes for women, they can be triggered by pregnancy, sometimes auto autoimmune conditions actually improve during pregnancy. And there actually is a relationship with progesterone and, and um, immune regulation. So let's, let's cruise on here. Wilson's low temperature syndrome. Who's heard of this? Okay, 
I got, oh, somebody else. We got more than one. Come on, nobody, really? This is usually like the hot topic. When I gave a presentation at uh, the Integrated Medicine Conference, everybody got on their edge to their seat. They're like, oh, what's he going to say? This is going to get good. So um, Dennis Wilson was a doctor who theorized that somewhere inside of the cell, there can be a flaw in the thyroid pathway. If we think about the human body, so many things miraculously work well for us to be alive and functioning. But there's a disease for everything that doesn't. And the thyroid hormone has to get into the cell, trigger the receptor, and drive uh, transcription at the level of the genes. And so his theory was something can go awry in the cell. People's hormone levels can be great, their TSH can be great, but they can still be symptomatic because the defect is in the cell and we don't know how to measure that yet. And that was his theory. And to be honest, he, his theory is probably true. I mean, for everything that works, there's a situation where it doesn't. And so the problem was, the way he measured it was um, he would have patients take their basal body temperature by putting a thermometer in their armpit, measure their temperature for a while, and if their temperature was below 98.6 consistently, he would sometimes say, you have Wilson's low temperature syndrome, let's give you thyroid medication. Well, there are other things that can lower your temperature. And unfortunately, the way it played out was someone was injured pretty severely doing this type of treatment and the medical boards came after him and he almost lost his license and he had to promise never to ever do this again. But other practitioners continued doing this and um, I have patients who have seen practitioners around town who are being treated this way who do feel better, but I always tell them is that we've got to be really careful because like I said before, there are other things that can cause the same symptoms as hypothyroidism that we need to keep our eyes open, that we aren't treating a nutrition deficiency or insomnia or a shift work disorder with thyroid medication rather than really treating the problem. Um, it's a very controversial diagnosis and uh, Dr. Dennis Wilson got in a lot of hot water for doing that. Um, so let's keep cooking. Okay, do what in my gut? So we talked about um, deiodinases, yeah? And there's, this is where we're going to get a little tweaky for a moment because part of this talk was for practitioners. Um, if your eyes gloss over this because it gets into a little too much biochemistry, just bear with me. It's just two slides. Um, T4, you can think of it like a precursor hormone. It's a little bit active, but T3 is significantly more active. Now, for all of the hormones in your body that are very active, your body is very careful with those and it gets rid of them quickly. Like you don't want the hot sauce cruising around a long time. So the T3 lasts a much shorter period, okay? So this thing called half-life is a measure of how long something stays in your body, how quickly it breaks it down basically and gets it out. And so T4 lasts a long time, it's a precursor hormone. T3, which is the active form, the half-life is about a day, okay? Um, the deiodinases convert T4 into either T3 or reverse T3 like we saw on the slide earlier. Now, some people who are treated with T4, they actually do different doses on different days. And you might think they'd feel good one day, bad the next. But you can get away with that because when you're doing this alternate dosing with T4, you're kind of just topping off the reserve tank. And then the body is converting it as needed. Now, if you really over flooded the tank, you can definitely drive them into becoming hyperthyroid, but you can't actually alternate the dose with T4 because it has this long half-life. T3, however, some people um, have a lot of trouble converting T4 into T3, so we wind up using T3 preparations. And T3, when people take it in the morning, often they start to feel tired by the mid-afternoon around 2 or 3 o'clock. And so you often wind up doing twice a day dosing because the body clears it so fast. And that gets really tricky because thyroid hormone is bound by calcium and other minerals. And so you have to be careful about twice a day dosing because people need to eat lunch, right? And so that can be tricky and something to work with. So 
D1 um, is one of the diagnoses. It's primarily in these tissues, D2 is in those, D3 is in these. You guys really don't need to know that. Um, and this is really the key thing. The diiodinases, if you actually look at their structure, they have a selenium in the middle of them. Just like with thyroid hormone, it has the tyrosine with iodines tacked on it. If you don't have iodine, can't make it. If you don't have selenium, you can't make your diiodinases because it's, it's in the center of this thing. And so if you have a selenium deficiency, which I just learned from a patient last week is really common in Montana. Apparently the soils in Montana are selenium deficient um, and in other places, then you're gonna have trouble with your diiodinases and you'll have trouble converting T4 to T3. And we need about 200 micrograms of selenium a day. Iron is also a cofactor that's needed for this process. And so if you're iron deficient for a variety of reasons, maybe you have low stomach acid, maybe you've had um, part of your intestines removed, maybe um, you have low iron in your diet, or maybe you have a, um, a slow grade uh, GI bleed or gastritis or something like that that's causing you to lose your iron, or you're a woman with heavy menstrual period, so it's hard for you to keep your iron up, you're gonna have a little difficulty converting T4 to T3. So again, it's, it's looking at this whole system and saying, oh, this person's just iron deficient. That's why they have trouble with their conversion. We don't need to give them T3. We need to con fix their conversion from T of T4 to T3. And that's really fixing the problem. So let's keep looking here. So um, everything cruises around the body bound to the binding globulins. And it has to get into the cell here. Um, let's see. Um, reverse T3, let's talk about that. So here we have these diiodinases, and you have D1 and D2 that are going to take T4, convert it into T3. You have D3 that's converting into reverse T3. Well, here's a, a quirky thing. The ratio of the diiodinases in your brain is different from what's out in your body. And so the predominant ones, that, the enzymes that are in your brain, are different from what's out in your body. And the ones in your brain, there's some studies saying that they're less impacted by nutrition deficiencies. It's almost like your body says, even though we're going to slow down the metabolism in, outside, we got to keep the brain going. Okay, brain's pretty essential. And so you may be turning down the, the throttle outdoors, like in your body, but inside in your brain, you want to keep things humming, okay? Uh, there's an interesting story I like to tell. It might be on the next slide. Oh, it's not. It's uh, coming up soon, but I'll go ahead and tell it now. So there's a, an interesting study looking at something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is looking at what influences the expression of your genes. And it turns out everything from the food you eat, your mental status, your stress, your environmental exposures, your relationships, what your ancestors did, um, all influences which genes are turned on and off in your body. So it's not just the genes you have, more importantly, it's which ones are turned on. And so during the Irish potato famine, they didn't have many calories because they had a potato famine. And the people who were able to make more reverse T3 and slow down their metabolism and thus need fewer calories actually had a survival advantage. And to this day, people who are descendants of Irish that survived the potato famine have a higher propensity to making more reverse T3. So it's not that reverse T3 is bad, it's an adaptive response. It's just not good if you're making it when you don't need to. Um, so if we look at things that inhibit the, the D1 and D2 diiodinases and affect your conversion of T4 to T3, certain medications will do it, selenium deficiency, lack of protein and excess carbohydrates. And this is a relative thing. If you're eating a super high carbohydrate diet, no one in America does that. Um, <laughs> 
and have adequate, uh, inadequate protein or inadequate digestion of your protein. Um, being on proton pump inhibitors and those kinds of medications can affect your protein digestion. Um, compromised liver function, general inflammation, exposure to cadmium, mercury, lead, herbicides, pesticides. These all can affect your conversion of T4 to T3. Um, excess estrogen and then high reverse T3 itself can impact this conversion. Okay? So we're looking at nutrient absorption and again this is more a systems biology perspective. We're looking at the gut now to see how your gut is driving your thyroid function. So in your intestines you have these little things called microvilli. They look like tiny little microscopic fingers. And what they do is they increase the surface area of your gut. If you were to stretch your gut out, stretch out all these microvilli, it'd be like the length of a football field or longer. So all these little ridges increase the surface area. And along these ridges are where the cells are that make enzymes for digesting your food. And also the cells that are involved in bringing uh, nutrients in when they've been appropriately digested. Well, if you have inflammation in your small intestine, if you have celiac disease or other food sensitivities or food allergies that cause inflammation along your GI tract, if you have infections with certain bacteria or even just imbalances in the bacteria of your gut, something that's called dysbiosis, the microvilli can kind of be mowed down or denuded. And with that, you decrease the surface area of your gut but you also lose a lot of the cells that are making the enzymes that would digest your food. So you can become functionally intolerant of certain foods. You have trouble digesting them because you aren't making enough of the enzyme. So some people who are moderately lactose intolerant, um, if we heal their gut and they start regrowing the cells that make the lactase enzyme, they actually become less lactose intolerant. Um, and dairy has its own issues, but that's just a, a commonly known example. And so if you have inflammation along the lining of your gut and you have trouble with nutrient absorption, you can become deficient in these nutrients that are essential for thyroid function. So healing the gut can help with nutrient absorption and then downstream effects of your thyroid function. So this slide is super geeky. You can gloss over and ignore it, but we're just, we're going to go there. As I was, again, this is for a different talk, but I left it in just for kicks and giggles. So your thyroid hormone actually gets converted by a few other enzymes into other things. Part of it actually gets converted into a neurotransmitter. And in some people, that neurotransmitter actually induces a, like a torpor-like state. It makes you feel kind of out of it and zombie-like. Um, and there are other enzymes involved that, that affect that. Certain people have variants in these enzymes, the MAO monoamine oxidase enzyme, that makes it slower than the average person. And if you happen to be someone who makes a lot of this and you've got that slow enzyme, having trouble converting your T4 into T3, so you have a lot of T4 rolling around, you'll start making more of this neurotransmitter product and be tired. Okay? Not just hypothyroid, you're making a neurotransmitter that makes you tired. Okay? So things are a little more complicated than just checking a, a TSH and a T4. Um, this next bit is, I think this is actually worth knowing and for the general population. So in your liver, there are different ways of detoxifying things. One of them is through this process of sulfation and glucuronidation. Uh, it's otherwise known as phase two detoxification. So you're adding a glucurate onto things and it makes it more soluble in your poop. And so you can poop it out and get it out of your body. Well, in your gut, there are bacteria that have enzymes called deglucuronidases, meaning they take the glucurate off and make the hormone free again. This happens to estrogens and other hormones as well, cortisol, for instance. Um, and so, if the bacteria of your gut are out of balance and you're making, you have a lot of this deglucuronidase, you can affect the circulation of the hormones. Because once they become free, they get reabsorbed into your gut. It's called the 
enterohepatic circulation. So there's a circulation in your body between things that get detoxed, deglucuronidated, and reabsorbed. And so it's true for estrogens, thyroid, cortisol. And so another example of how your microbiome and the health of your gut affects your thyroid hormone. Kind of a geeky one, but basically just saying, if you're trying to look under the hood and look at nutrition, inflammation, stress, doing the step of healing the gut and getting in balanced is often a very key component and it has impacts in lots of areas. It affects your nutrient absorption, affects the circulation of your hormones, lowers inflammation, so on. So goitrogens, um, who's heard of a goitrogen? Okay. You're my like plant. You like answer everything. It's good. So, <laughs> so goitrogens are foods that have a suppressive effect on the thyroid. Uh, some more than others. And like goiter, making a big and large thyroid, if you eat a whole lot of these, you could suppress your thyroid enough so as to become hypothyroid. I've actually seen this. I had a patient who got super into kale smoothies. And she was drinking like a whole head of juiced kale every day. And she came in and she was mildly hypothyroid. And it's because kale's in the brassica family and raw brassicas um, have a goitrogenic effect. If you steam or cook them, they have a lot less of a goitrogenic effect. It's a great family. They have wonderful nutrients in them, things like indole 3 carbonyl and so on. And so you don't have to take them out completely you just need to cook them or steam them. If, you're, if you've got a thyroid condition, raw brassicas are probably not something to be part of your diet. If you're being treated and you're just like a kaleaholic or you love broccoli beyond belief, you could treat over that and compensate for your um, brassica addiction. Um, <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, but just to keep in mind of its effect. So we have, you know, kind of millet, strawberries, peaches, spinach, sweet potatoes. You can do a, a simple Google search. There are some reputable websites like Mayo Clinic that have a nice list of, of goitrogens. Um, so, yeah, so if we're looking at common medications that have an effect of the conversion, beta blockers, it's a really common blood pressure medication, okay? Uh, birth control pills, estrogen replacement. It's very in vogue right now, doing bioidentical hormone replacement. Um, that will increase your thyroid binding globulin, and it slows your conversion of T4 to T3. So it has a double effect. Uh, so you gotta be careful about system-wide effects of things. When we think about solitary interventions of, oh, my estrogen's low, I wanna get my estrogen up to a certain level because that's what's supposed to be good, and I read it on a website, let me do it. Here we go. Okay, but that estrogen has downstream metabolites that can have various effects in the body, can affect uh, genetic damage possibly can influence your thyroid and, and various other things. So you just have to keep things in mind that the body is an interdependent system. Um, theophylline is an old school um, asthma medication. Happens to be in tea. Yeah, anybody ever drank too much tea and got this kind of like, ha ah, ha kind of feeling? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Felt like your brachio tubes were doing a little number dance in your chest. That's theophylline, okay? Um, so a lot of things on here. I just included this for, to be complete. So if you wanna download the slides online, you can look at all the different medications and where they have an effect on thyroid. Um, very common things on here. Um, here we have estrogen again. We've got, um, let's see, what's a more common one that people take? Uh, let's see, you know, lithium, you know, for bipolar, amiodarone, that's an antiarrhythmic drug, um, androgens, those are like male hormones, um, yeah. So methadone, you know, so here we go. Toxins, again, this is probably too small to read from the back, but you can download the slides online. And there are a lot of environmental toxins that have a big effect. This particular site that I pulled it from was highlighting the effect of um, PCBs in our environment on various functions. And you can see red dye number three, it's pretty common. Dioxin is um, an old school kind of pesticide. I think it was also in 
Agent Orange, and uh, it has all sorts of other bad effects. Um, yeah, so lots of things affect thyroid function. Gluten, okay? So gluten-free, right? Everybody's into it. Is it a fad? Is it real? What's going on? So you got to understand that there's a difference between celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, NCGS, and reactions to modern hybridized wheat. So let's touch on this because I get this question all the time. So celiac disease has a genetic um, pattern to it. It's related to a certain um, HLA protein. And that is a true allergy, okay? Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is working along different pathways, actually, okay? Now, some people have acquired a sensitivity to gluten either by overexposure to gluten or by their gut becoming porous and gluten or gluten breakdown products making it into the bloodstream and the, and the immune system saying, oh, you're not supposed to be here and creating antibodies against it. So that situation is referred to as an acquired food sensitivity. So your, the cells of your gut are bound together by these things called tight junctions. And there are proteins called zonulins. It sounds like something from Star Trek. And zonulins cause the tight junctions to open up. And so things can get between those cells and make it into your bloodstream. Cholera toxin works that way. And so it turns out that modern hybridized wheat, which was developed in the 50s, and they won a Nobel Prize for it. The idea was to cure world hunger. So they made a wheat that was shorter, had more protein, had more calories, easier to grow, drought tolerant. Sounds great. It wasn't genetically modified. They just crossed with um, different grasses to get these traits, just hybridized. What turns out in that crossing pattern, there are proteins in modern hybridized wheat that were never part of wheat to begin with. One of them just happens to be a zonulin. And it has that effect of opening the tight junctions in your gut. And it can cause um, a pathway to open where things that normally your immune system would never see make it into the bloodstream and you have an interaction with your immune system, your body may develop antibodies against it, IgG antibodies. And so that's referred to as an acquired food sensitivity. If you calm down the inflammation in your gut, get the zonulins away and those tight junctions repair, and you stay away from those foods for a while, the antibody levels tend to drop with acquired food sensitivity and your reaction to those foods can significantly decrease and in some cases go away. So that's non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And modern hybridized wheat, also depending on the strain, can have uh, four to 40% more um, gluten in it than the original einkorn forms of wheat. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so we look at subclinical hypothyroidism. 71% of patients who didn't have the autoimmune type of hypo, um, subclinical hypothyroidism got better going off of gluten. 71% is huge, right? And we think along, what are the pathways with this? So it, it affects the immune system, it affects the lining of the gut and the microvilli. So when the gut healed and you were able to absorb all of the nutrients, the subclinical hypothyroidism went away, okay? So again, it's treating the root of the problem here. With the people who had autoimmune hypothyroid, so Graves disease, um, Graves disease is hyperthyroid, Hashimoto's is hypothyroid, we wind up with 60% getting better. When they did a reanalysis of the study, 80% of the people that didn't improve just didn't comply with a the diet. They were sneaking bagels and things like that. So it may have been even a larger percentage. Okay? So gluten is one of the low-hanging fruit of treating thyroid conditions. If we, uh, so we, we touched upon this briefly before, and the question is about normal ranges in the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So the National Academy of Biochemistry, which is in, um, in Europe, they say the normal range should be from 0.4 to 2.5 for a TSH. The American College of Clinical Endocrinologists, they say, that's in the US, they say 0.3 to 3.0, okay? Um, and here we have another 0.4 to, to 2.5. Um, 
if we use this narrowed range, we start calling a lot more people hypothyroid, right? Because somebody who previously had a TSH of 3.7 and the upper limit in the lab report is 4.5, a practitioner might look at that and say, oh, it's within range, it's fine. You're good, you're in range. But they actually might feel quite tired with that. And so if you just looked at the TSH and looked at the range in the lab report, you would miss a lot of things. But even if you just looked at the TSH and it was within this range, you still would miss things. So what else do you get? So it used to be that the test for free T3 and free T4 wasn't so accurate. And free T3 and free T4 is looking at the fraction of T3 and T4 that is not bound to thyro, thyroid binding globulin. And we talked about the, the taxi cabs, the proteins that the thyroid hormone rides around on. It was the blue rectangles in that slide earlier on. And so now this test is actually accurate. And so we can look at this and see how much active hormone is actually available to get the job done. And we can bypass some of the um, complications of thyroid globulin levels, um, bi thyroid binding globulin levels. So if you're going to do just the full thing, you would get a TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, total T3, antithyroid antibodies, which is the thyroid peroxidase, thyroid binding globulin, and then get a morning urine iodine, okay? I didn't used to check the iodine, but to my surprise, I started checking a couple years ago. And I'll usually check it when maybe I'm seeing somebody for the first time or when they've got subclinical hypothyroidism or things just aren't responding well. Iodine deficiency happens the further away from the ocean you get, basically. So up here in Western North Carolina, we actually have a decent amount of low-grade iodine deficiency. Um, if you're under 50 micrograms of iodine ingested per day, you're gonna have symptoms. So the US RDA is 150 micrograms per day. Iodine primarily comes from um, seafood, things like that, kelp, fish, so on. Um, people in Asheville often joke that there's like a pink Himalayan sea salt iodine deficiency epidemic going on. <laughs> Everybody's like, I'm gonna get my pink Himalayan salt. And I've tested a lot of folks and time and time again, their urine iodine comes back with none detectable. And it's not that they don't have any iodine in their body, it's that their body's holding on to everything that they've got, right? And, oh, what was you gonna say? Oh, yeah, oh. Where are all the pink Himalayan salt, does, well, I don't understand that reference. Oh, it's, um, people are getting this pink Himalayan salt and it's not iodized, it doesn't have a significant iodine content versus iodized salt, okay. which does. That's why they did iodized salt and would iodinate bread and things like that, it was because iodine deficiency was fairly common. And so if you were eating pink Himalayan salt and lived in Montana, you'd be iodine and selenium deficient, right? <laughs> and so um, anyway, so I, I've been testing this more frequently. And again, it's the microgram dosing, not the milligram dosing. The milligram dosing has the potential to cause problems. Um, so here's something that is uh, a little controversial, total T3. They test this more in Europe, and the reason why is we're going to look at some ratios. And one ratio um, is this free T3 to free T4 ratio. And you'll see this referred to on the web a lot. This is actually a legitimate thing. They, they use this in Europe for checking to see if you're at an optimal level. Um, but Reverse T3, the lab test, it's not free reverse T3, okay? So if you're gonna do a ratio with reverse T3, you have to compare it to a bound hormone as well. So you look at total T3, which is the free and bound fractions together. So if you're gonna look at this ratio, you have to do total T3 and reverse T3. Rarely do people actually do this. You can kind of visually look at where people are on their reverse T3 range versus their T3 range and get a feel for, oh, you know, all your T4 is going to reverse T3, you're not converting. It's just, it's not that hard to see visually. Um, but again, even with this ratio here, 
you'll find practitioners that are aiming to get everybody to that, to a free T3, free T4 ratio of 0.33. Not everybody feels good there. You treat the person, not the number, okay? This is like a guide. It's not the goal. Um, yeah, so um, reverse T3 effects, we talked about this a little bit. Um, it can actually block the conversion to T4 to T3. It can block the binding receptor. It's adaptive in certain situations. Our modern lifestyle, you know, I'm often talking to people about, okay, good. She's telling me, no, I need to keep, I need to cut it short soon. Um, I'm often talking about what are you consuming? And this involves your media, your social media, you know, is the, what you're taking in through news, your social media, your Facebook, your whatever, is that giving you indigestion? Because I can tell you, after this last election, people on both sides of the fence, whether you're conservative or liberal, people were having a lot of stress. And I saw people with thyroid conditions, irritable bowel, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, all of that was getting worse for like two or three months because everybody was wound up because they were watching this inflammatory news all the time. Everybody was just, ah! And you could see it in the clinic. You know, people coming in with anxiety, insomnia, heart palpitations, worsening thyroid. And I was just like, you need to stop watching the news. You get off Facebook. Like, limit your email to like a couple chunks a day. Turn the alerts off on your phone. Like, this is, this is throwing you out of balance. So think about all the things in your life. Um, we'll talk about lifestyle in a moment. Um, so another thing that can happen is if you look at, um, if you over-treat somebody with T4, you can drive the reverse T3 pathway because your body's going, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want to have too much T3. So if you look at somebody's uh, labs and their T4 is like towards the upper limit of normal or even off normal range, and their reverse T3 is high and their T3 is low, chances are in that situation, they're just over-treated with T4, and the body's trying to protect itself. So that can happen also. And this is the potato story from Ireland that we already discussed. So this is a summary slide that basically shows where the different things have an effect on this pathway. Um, and so that'll be in the slides that you can download. You see zinc and selenium there. You see stress, trauma. People who have had traumatic, traumatic events in their life can have a higher baseline level of cortisol. And cortisol has all sorts of effects on the body. It can actually cause your um, intestinal lining to become porous. It has an effect somewhat like the zonulins do. Um, can drive immune pathways, worsening Hashimoto's or even Graves. Um, so. You see vitamin A that's important for intracellular expression. Um, yeah. So let's talk about lifestyle. In the past 30 years, there's been more evidence around lifestyle as an intervention for preventing and even reversing diseases. So the thing that I really love about medicine right now, there's a lot of totally wackadoodle things about our healthcare system, but there's great research coming out in the lifestyle field. There have been studies looking at actually reversing early stage cancers through lifestyle intervention that involve nutrition, fitness, healthy relationships, and stress management. That that recipe works together to affect your genetic expression, lower inflammation, all sorts of stuff, making sure you're getting good nutrition. And so when we're, this is uh, actually a diagram taken from Dean Ornish. He was one of the pioneers of lifestyle medicine. And this is the way that they present it. It's an elegant approach. Um, and so, you know, it just has all of these different effects that work together to promote health. And one of the studies that Dean Ornish's group did, they were looking at reversing prostate cancer. So these were guys with diagnosed prostate cancer. They put them on a lifestyle intervention and a significant portion of them, their prostate cancer went away. Well, they had a geneticist following them and they were looking at genetic expression and genes related to cancer promotion turned down or turned off, and genes related to longevity turned on. And markers of aging, something called telomeres, which shorten as you age, actually lengthened. So for the first time, they saw a medical intervention, a lifestyle intervention, 
almost reverse some signs of aging. So that's pretty cool. And imagine if everybody was getting this message of be nice, sleep, eat real food, slow down, um, get outside some. It, it'd be different, maybe a different place. So nutrients that are essential to thyroid health, I'll just run through them and you can go online and get these later. Zinc, 15 to 30 milligrams. You have to be careful about zinc. If you get too much, it can um, inhibit copper absorption. And so about 20 um, milligrams a day, that's usually safe without messing with your copper. It's people who are popping these zinc lozenges when they get sick. You can affect your copper metabolism. Selenium, two to 400 micrograms a day. Um, iron, ferritin is a measure of your iron stores and you want it to be about 60 to 80. Ferritin can also be affected by other things. If you have a lot of inflammation in your body, ferritin can be falsely elevated, and so you have to interpret it in, in light of that. Iodine, I put 150 to 200 micrograms in here. Some places you'll see 150 to 450. Here's an interesting thing. 90% of omnivores, and this is averaging around the world, including people who live on the coastlines are iodine deficient. 25% of vegetarians and 80% of vegans are iodine deficient. And so, you know, with... What about seaweed? Pardon me? Seaweed. Oh yeah, it's in iodine. I mean, iodine's in there. So if they're, if they're eating seaweed, if vegans are eating seaweed, they may be fine. So it's just that uh, people who are vegetarian or vegan need to consciously look for sources of iodine to include in their diet. Um, they're just things that commonly can be left out of a vegetarian or vegan diet. Um, okay, we talked about micrograms versus milligrams. I think I've hammered that point home. Vitamin A, it's important for intracellular nuclear signaling, and then vitamin D. Vitamin D has to be converted from D2 into D3. D3 is the active form. It's dependent on sunlight for that conversion. Now, it's regional the dosage for vitamin D. In Western North Carolina, we, we test all of our patients here, and almost everybody that either doesn't summer, I mean winter in Florida, or is taking a vitamin D supplement comes back low. And so most people in Western North Carolina, it's about 2,000 units in the summer, up to 5,000 units in the winter. Some people need more. But I've never seen anyone who lives here full time go too high with two to 5,000 units if they live in Western North Carolina. So, um, thyroid treatments. So we touched on this. Uh, levothyroxine is generic T4. Synthroid and Levoxyl are the two main brand name uh, T4 products. Um, there is that generic T4 product that's gluten-free that I mentioned earlier. It's made by the company Mylan. Um, I have a few patients that have sought that out and they just asked their pharmacy to find that particular brand. Um, there are T4, T3 combinations. So if you get on the web, you're going to find people trying to mimic the ratio of T4 to T3 that's in the human body and you'll see a lot of controversy around that. Um, some people say it's just not necessary to try to mimic that ratio if conversion is good, if the T4 to T3 conversion is good. If the T4 to T3 conversion is good, you might actually be able to get away with just using T4 as long as you don't have an allergy to one of the binders in that medication. <coughs> now, the T4, T3 combinations have an effect that can mimic what the body does naturally. Um, both your adrenals and your thyroid kind of bump in the morning. You get a little surge of T3 in the morning. It's kind of that wake you up, warm you up, get you out of bed. And when people take the T4, T3 combination medications in the morning, they get a little of that natural surge, wake you up, get you out of bed, and they like that. The challenge, though, is when you go to test somebody's labs who are taking a combination, either be it compounded or these are the brand name compound, uh, brand name T4, T3 combinations, you actually can't get Thyrolar in the US for some reason. Um, when you test them, if you take T4, T3, if the timing is right, you go to test their labs and you catch them right at that T3 surge. And they're going to come back looking over-treated. 
So their TSH will look normal, their T4 will look normal, but their T3 will be through the roof. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm over treating them. So often what practitioners will do is if you're taking a T4, T3 combination or a natural desiccated thyroid, they have you not take the medication the morning of your test. Now when you do that, your TSH is going to be appropriate because TSH doesn't change as rapidly as your thyroid hormones. So your TSH will be appropriate for your, uh, it'll reflect your medication dosage. Your T4 will be a little lower because T4 has a longer half-life, it stays in the body longer, but your T3 will actually come back looking low. So you just interpret the results knowing that the T3 is low, it's normally higher than that because you didn't take the medication, but that way you kind of avoid looking like you've over-treated somebody. So it's just a, a thing you have to know if you're taking a T4, T4, T3 combination or a natural desiccated thyroid product, you just have to test a little differently to avoid weird lab results. Um, T3, cytomel, liothyronine, that is sometimes used for people who have um, a really bad T4 to T3 conversion. You can't figure it out. Um, it's complicated by, it has a short half-life. So you take it in the morning and a lot of it's wearing off by mid-afternoon. So you often have to do a second dosage. And that second dosage is tricky just because you had to eat and you can't take thyroid medication around your meal. And so what some practitioners will do is they'll over-treat a little bit in the afternoon to compensate for some of it being bound in your gut. Normally, um, pharmacists will say you need to take your medication two hours away from your meal. Well, if you got, you know, when do you eat then? if you're gonna take this in the afternoon. So you can do it one hour away from your meal and just kind of compensate for a lack of absorption, but then the people need to eat consistently at the same time and about the same amount and about the same thing, or you're gonna get a lot of variation in their symptoms. So personally, I try to stay away from doing a lot of T3s just because after treating a lot of folks, I find that people have a hard time with it. But if somebody's got a T4, T3 conversion and nothing else has worked, they're often very motivated to deal with it. Um, natural desiccated thyroid, there's Armour, Nature Thyroid, WP Thyroid, West Thyroid. Uh, the active ingredient's the same, okay? It's porcine thyroid, um, ground up pig thyroid, and the binders are different. Uh, some people like WP Thyroid because it, it's the simplest formula, it's the most hypoallergenic, and uh, it's actually fairly affordable now, and it's easy to find. Um, armor, but all of these do work. If you don't have any allergies to the binders and don't have any problem, um, they, all, they all will work. Um, with these, because it has T3 in it, some people can get away with once a day dosing. And that works great. It's nice because it's elegant, it's simple, once a day, do it in the morning, forget about it. Um, but some people need twice a day dosing with the natural thyroid products. So I usually start with once a day and see what happens. How are you doing? And if they're getting that slump around 2, 3 p.m., then sometimes we'll do a partial, we'll break their dosage apart and put part of it in the afternoon just to help them kind of, as the T3's coming down, we'll get it up. Or maybe we'll look again and see if they're having a T4 to T3 conversion problem. Because theoretically, with the natural desiccated thyroid, the T4 in it should be getting converted into T3 as the afternoon comes along. And that's... It's supposed to be how they work, um, but that doesn't always work. Now, this is interesting. You can get glandular products over the counter. So you can get adrenal glandulars from uh, bovine adrenals. And you see a lot of people doing this, but those are active hormone products. You can get thyroid glandulars, porcine glandulars over the counter. And they're just sold as supplements in the stores. So whenever you go to buy a thyroid supplement, say you're going to I want a thyroid support supplement or something. And you're looking for something that's got selenium and vitamin A and vitamin D and um, iodine. And you, you, just, you don't want to take a lot of things. Just, just give me one pill that's got it. That's what I would do. You got to read the label because some of these products will also stick in there some porcine glandular. And so you aren't just getting iodine and selenium and you know, vitamin A. You may actually be getting active thyroid hormone. And so there are some practitioners that are not MDs that treat thyroid. Some of them do a pretty good job. 
and a lot of them will use these over-the-counter glandular products. If you're gonna go that route, you need to make sure that the thing is third-party tested, so there's an independent third-party lab testing the product, and they're testing for purity, so nothing else is in it, and what is supposed to be in it is in it, and it's at the right dosage. So one of the benefits of using the um, pharmaceutical natural desiccated thyroid is it has to go through strict testing to make sure that the active ingredients are within a certain range. And so these things exist, they can be used well, but you have to be careful about the product and that it doesn't sneak into your medicine cabinet in inadvertently. Yep. Um, okay. Voila, that's it. So anybody know Buckmeister, Buckmeister Fuller? Yeah, okay, good. He was over at Black Mountain College over there, Lake <laughs> Eden, all of that. So truth is a relationship, life is synergetic. He was all into the interdependent relationships of things. And he was kind of a forerunner for the systems thinking and systems biology. And he was here in Asheville, that's cool. Um, okay, questions? Oh, you go first, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I heard somebody tell somebody that um, if you take betadine, you know the, the kind that you put on the cotton swab, you know, for wounds? Uh huh. The brown and stuff? Yeah, yeah. If you put that on your stomach, the patch it absorbs test. really quickly. Uh huh. It means your body's deficient and it's a really inexpensive way of getting iodine. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Like, what, what do you think of that? So that's called the iodine patch test. And a lot, of, a lot of providers will use that as a screen to see if people are iodine deficient or not. Uh -huh. um, there have been studies looking at that and it hasn't proven to be accurate. Hasn't been? Okay. Yeah. But so, I mean, if some, maybe there's some truth to it, but it's not what I would use to diagnose. The gold standard is an early morning urine iodine. And you want your iodine, urine iodine level to be close to 200 or a little above that. Okay. So. And that's, it's actually not an expensive test, so. Okay. Yeah. I'll make sure they get that information. <laughs> cool. yeah. Uh, yeah. So directly, as it seems for a, a level of thyroxin, uh -huh. is to take it with uh, plenty of water? Yeah. yeah what's plenty? I would say eight ounces, probably. I don't know for sure. Um, but part of it is you're trying to get it past your stomach and absorbed, I mean, into in your stomach and absorbed, because most people, even though their pharmacist and their doctor and everybody tells them don't eat it with food, most people are hammering their breakfast 30 to 45 minutes later just because their day gets going. And so that recommendation is just to try to get it in, get it absorbed, because in practical life, people eat their breakfast. So, <laughs> yeah. Pardon me? If there's no estrogen floating in the system, yeah. none at all. None? Yeah. So what happens to your thyroid then? So one of the pathways that that would affect is estrogen affects your thyroid binding globulin. And so your thyroid binding globulin would be lower, uh, relatively speaking. And so that would leave for a higher free fraction of your thyroid hormones. So um, you'd have more free hormone to be converted from T4 into T3 and be active. Um, I think, if I remember right, let's go back here. Estrogen, where is it on there? It's not on this one. It, um, I think it also affects the diiodinases that convert T4 to T3, but I don't remember if it was an upregulation or a downregulation. Um, so whether it, it drives that enzyme or whether it suppresses it. So, uh, yeah. let's see here. This is that slide. Um, estrogen, increased thyroxine binding globulins, and where else is estrogen? Uh, inhibition, uh, er, er, er. anyway. Um, anyway, does anybody else, anybody else see it? There's one. Okay, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, sure, yeah. Is there a treatment that's for curing as opposed to treating? depends on the situation. So if the subclinical hypothyroidism, um, if it's driven by stress, inflammation, and malnutrition, getting the inflammation down, decreasing stress, and applying, supplying the appropriate nutrients will cure it in some cases. Hashimoto, Hashimoto is more 
Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition, so there's another level to that. You can get a subclinical hypothyroidism that is Hashimoto's also. Um, and that was referenced in one of the slides about the um, people who had subclinical hypothyroidism that was op autoimmune and went on a gluten-free diet. So with Hashimoto's, you're looking for what's driving their immune system. Because the thing that's frustrating for Hashimoto's for people is as the state of your immune system fluctuates, the state of your antibodies can fluctuate. You can have more or less antibodies. When you have more antibodies, you have more of an attack on your thyroid. You become more hypothyroid. If you have less antibodies, you get a rebound. And so when you're treating somebody who has Hashimoto's, you know, out of the gates, you don't know if you're catching them when they're at their best or at their worst. And so you don't know if, like, if I treat them now, and then they go out and go on this great diet, I'm going to be over-treating them because their immune system may gear down, their antibodies may gear down, and I was treating them at a level to compensate for their previous antibody levels. Let's say I've got somebody, and they're just at their best. Their lifestyle is dialed in. Their nutrients are great. And then they go on a chocolate cake bender or something, or whatever drives their immune system. Then they'll, they'll be under-treated because their antibody levels can surge. Some people, they can have such a rapid surge of their antibody levels that the attack on their thyroid causes a spilling of thyroid hormone temporarily. And they can feel hyperthyroid temporarily and then drop to hypothyroid. And some of these people can actually feel kind of bipolar because it's like, whoa, 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 up and down. Um, and I, I've had some patients that it took us a little while to figure out what was driving their thing. And their, their antibodies were just swinging all over the place. And I felt sorry for them. I was like, this has got to be hard to live with. So they're better now, though. It's good. <laughs> you know, about Chinese medicine in this talk. So Chinese medicine would be referenced in, in the situation of um, it is a systems-based theory. So it's, um, and they would talk about it in different language. It's interesting that the language of Chinese medicine is often the language of metaphor. It's the language of relationship. So it's the language of how parts of a system relate to one another. And so they have herbal approaches in Chinese medicine that are supplying the nutrients, decreasing the inflammation, healing the lining of the gut. Uh, so they're getting at the same stuff. Um, whether it's going to be enough to treat somebody who has a really bad Hashimoto's or who has a, um, a primary hypothyroidism that isn't autoimmune, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Oh, oh, is the goitrogen? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a goitrogen. It's, um, it's a little controversial, actually, soy. Um, some people say that fermented soy is not. I don't have it on there. I was kind of dodging the controversy. Because um, <laughs> I, I was at a hormone conference not long ago, and the guy spent like 15 minutes talking about soy. And at the end of it, he's like, eh. Um, and so. I would limit your soy intake if you are going to do soy, just to be on the safe side, fermented soy. Soy protein isolate is like a new thing in the human diet, and soy milk made from soy protein isolate can inhibit the um, absorption of essential nutrients. So I don't recommend that either. Um, and if you're going to do a dairy substitute, things like um, unsweetened almond milk, you can make your own really easy, uh, things like that. Good. Um, Anybody else? Questions? Questions? One more. If you have a cyst in the thyroid, does that affect the thyroid function? It depends. And so some cysts are active and some are not. Some cysts are there because of an iodine deficiency. Some cysts are there, um, they just developed for some reason. We don't know why. Some of the cysts are um, what we call hot nodules, and that they're very active and they're cranking on a lot of thyroid hormone. So it depends on the cyst. Um, when anybody comes in with a cyst, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, uh, oh, iodine, we should test their iodine. So if they got fibrocystic breast or endometrial fibroids or a cyst on their thyroid, I'll, I'll usually get a urine iodine just to see. It's kind of like when somebody comes in with insomnia, constipation, and muscle spasms. I'm thinking, oh, magnesium, oh, you know, that kind of thing. So. Anything else? Good. That was a lot of information. I think we went a little over, but we're good. Okay, great. So, oh, yeah. <laughs>
and uh